Open your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. The title of today's message is Come to the Full Knowledge of the Truth. We're going to be looking at 1 Timothy chapter 2 during the main body of the message, but I want to set the introduction around Christ. Always that's my goal, but uh, I have a perfect introduction for this. Because in looking at Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see his humility. We see his submission to his Father's will. We see his goodness. We see his care and concern. And, and that is going to frame our understanding of First Timothy chapter 2. So... We're going to join the text in this introduction in Luke 22, verse 39. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. Now, when he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. As we look at the heartbreaking humility of Christ, we know what the end of the story is, and we can rejoice in that. And yet, even looking at the Garden of Gethsemane and what is happening, this is the beginning of his agony. He is going to go through hours and hours of humiliation. He will be beaten. He will be scourged. And he will be stripped of his relationship with his father. And he will drink every gulp of the ocean of God's wrath against sin. Can you see it in your mind's eye? Him on the cross, which he bore, which was ours. Can you see him struggling, eagerly going about our redemption, not putting it down until he could say, in truth, it is finished. He is such a good Savior. We have no friend like Jesus. His humility, his submission to the Father's will is based on his knowledge of who the Father is and the goodness and the rightness of his Father's plan. Today we're going to be looking at 1 Timothy chapter 2. It is a chapter that elicits quite an emotional response from the broadest cross-section of evangelical Christianity. It's full of Molotov cocktails, pitfalls, dangers. It is provocative, and yet set right in the center of it is Christ and his humility and his goodness. So I point us to the Garden of Gethsemane, to Calvary, so that we might understand the main point, which shows up in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this attitude, this way of thinking, which was also in Christ Jesus. When we come to a full knowledge of the truth, when we understand just how good God is, 
and in faith submit every aspect of our will and intent, our thinking, our life, our actions, our speech. When we come to that, we demonstrate that we actually know who Christ is and what he has done for us. If you get nothing else from this message today, I have to push this point. We are to think like Christ. When we think like Christ, we can say that we have come to a full knowledge of the truth. In a few moments, we're going to be looking at the context of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, a great little book that Paul writes to his protege. We're going to see uh, the love that Paul has and the model that he has made of himself for Timothy. Uh, that's going to be uh, really good. And it's going to be extremely important for framing out the, the back half of the message. We'll be looking at the sermon. We're going to go through the whole of 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're not going to dance around any of the hard topics. We're going to charge right into them. And we'll just see what the Lord has to say to us. And then we're going to conclude by going to Philippians chapter 2. And not only seeing Christ's humility, but also seeing the great reward that comes with it. So, let's open in prayer. Father God, certainly your son knows you in a way that we uh, cannot know you yet, but in faith we believe what you say about yourself in your word. You are good, you are trustworthy, and to be humble to be even compassionate for people is very good in your eyes and acceptable. Lord, as I, I pray as we look at this text that has so many controversial things in it, I pray that you would help us to respond in faith. This is a work that only you can do, Holy Spirit, and we know that you do it well. So we entrust this to you, the time, the results, and this body. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And while you're turning there, I'll start going through the context. So, just briefly, four little points of context. Paul met Timothy way back in Lystra, back in Acts chapter 16, on a second missionary journey, he's a young man. And Timothy believed in Christ, due in part to some measure of Paul's ministry to him. He calls him my genuine child in the faith. Now, this isn't the only uh, element that uh, contributed to Timothy's faith. Timothy also had a godly heritage. He had a godly Jewish mother and grandmother. This is key. Remember this. This is important. Don't let go of this bit of context. This is important. Timothy had a godly mother and grandmother that nurtured him, that taught him of the Lord. The year is now AD 62, about 10, 12 years after Paul has met Timothy. He has dispatched him to the church that is in Ephesus in order to teach the church in Ephesus proper doctrine and to help them understand what's bad doctrine. So we come to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and the immediate preceding context is of folks that have made a shipwreck in regard to their faith, that have rejected the truth. And then he sets chapter 2 
in opposition to that. There's a contrast. So we're going to be looking at all of 1 Timothy chapter 2. I've broken the text into three points. The first point is the proper priority in prayer. We're going to ask ourselves, how should we pray? You ever ask yourself that? How should I be praying? Is there a right way to pray? Jesus' disciples asked him, you know, teach us like John's disciples taught us to pray. Is there a right way to pray? Let's find out. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Actually, I'll just go to verse 2a. First of all, then, I exhort, that is an urge, that is a pleading, Paul is pleading that this will take place, this type of prayer. That petitions, prayers, requests, and thanksgivings be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority. We learn here that we are to be praying for people, for their salvation, even if we didn't vote for them, even if we don't like them. All. I love absolute terms. They're so much easier to deal with. You can wrap your head around that. All means all. Prayers, requests, petitions, and thanksgivings. Why thanksgivings? Can you be really thankful for every person? Every man? Is that possible? Is it possible to pray for people we don't like with an attitude that is grateful? We have come to the full knowledge of the truth. It is. We are to pray for all people with grateful praise. You see, Thanksgiving, it's like the best manifestation of faith. Because you're telling God with gratitude, with praise, recognizing him. You're telling him and recognizing what he has done. Thanksgiving is wonderful. It changes our mind. It changes how we perceive reality that's around us. Your prayers, your petitions, your requests that all men might be saved need to be framed with thanksgiving. How can we do that? We can know and we can tell God, thank you for doing what is right. Thank you for your good character. We're going to see this in just a second. The goodness that you have, your compassion towards people, Thank you. Thanksgiving and public praise, they must finish every petition, prayer, and request. It's an act of faith to turn it over to the Lord and say, thank you for the result, no matter what it may be. Did you know that God answers prayers for his own name's sake? He does it for his own glory. That's a, that's a good thing because he is glorious and worthy of recognition. So in answering the question, whom do we pray for? How should we pray? We are to pray for all people, even if they're on the other side of the aisle, even if they're red, blue, or green. We are to be praying for them and their salvation. I guess I would leave off by asking that hanging question, do we do this? It's heartbreaking to go to the airport or the state fair or anywhere there's this mass of people. I am overwhelmed when I look at people during Jamboree wondering, is there anybody here who is saved? How broad is the way that leads to destruction? How wide is it? This autobahn that people are sprinting toward eternal destruction, how wide is it? We are to pray and petition and request for their salvation because if we have come to a full knowledge of the truth, like Christ has, We'll demonstrate that same compassion for all people, 
even if we don't like them. Verse 2b. Here's the reason why we are going to pray. So that, Paul writes, this is a purpose statement, we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Currently, we live in this abnormal bubble in the 21st century in North America where persecution doesn't really happen. It doesn't really happen. There will be a return to the mean. We will get back to normal. History will revert. It must. When we live out our faith, <laughs> well, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But we have work to do, Mark. We have a commission. We're to go out and share the good news. Yes, yes. So then let's pray for all these people. Moreover, let's pray that we might seek first his kingdom and peace. As long as peace prevails, let's enjoy it. When it disappears, so be it. God is still good. And he will sustain us no matter what. And his church will grow. Guaranteed. He has promised. But we like peace. So let's pray that we might do his work in peace. Paul presupposes that the saved will seek sinners You've heard of the good shepherd who seeks the lost. Paul presupposes that the saved believers will seek sinners like our Savior does. Do we? Do we? We have neighbors. We have friends. Are we more afraid of their rejection than of the accounting that we must give before the great God that loves us to death? Mm. That's food for thought, something to consider. I mention all of this. I plead with you like Paul pleads with you. I urge you toward this because God assesses this. Verse 3, this is good. Cologne, the word that has a semantic range of good, right, and beautiful. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. <laughs> Jesus does this. Do you get that? He did it for you, believer. <laughs> he went and found you when you hated him, when you're alienated and antagonistic and in rebellion against him. He found you. He is so good and compassionate. We cherish our salvation because we know, yeah, I am a depraved wretch. It's true. And he saved me. And yet, we can't really say that we've come to a full knowledge of the truth if we don't see that, yeah, there's others that are around us that need salvation as well. Have this way of thinking, which was in Christ Jesus. This is the proper priority in our prayer. Now, I don't say that so that we'll stop asking for health requests or travel concerns. No, but I want to prioritize, as we are told to prioritize here, spiritual requests. They're the ones that God answers that will continue to be answered in perpetuity. If somebody comes to Christ, they are going to sing his praises and glory forever. This body, it's a machine that we're using. It's a good tool. It will be glorified at one point. But for now, it's, it's not going to last. It's going to fall apart. I don't say that we don't pray for those things. But like Paul, I say, first of all, let's pray for people's salvation. Is Christ now at the right hand of the Father praying for people's salvation? Yeah. Is his Father granting repentance that leads to life? Yes. He is good. So let's have this way of thinking in ourselves. Verses 4 through 7. 
You know, a good sermon has Christ at the beginning, middle, and end. He penetrates every aspect of it. And, and Paul has done me a tremendous favor by writing the next words under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. Verse 4 through 7. Speaking of our God and Savior, that he desires all men to be saved and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. He's good. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, God's not fair, not right, not good. Oh, we were just hearing that this morning, somebody saying that. He is so good. He desires that all men be saved, to have that warm relationship with the Father that he enjoys. What a blessed gift to enjoy what we've been designed for. He goes on, verses 5 through 7. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the witness for this proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I am not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So, in looking at the Messiah, we can see here in verses 4 through 7, his motivation, what he desires, his mission, what he has accomplished, and his pattern of behavior that we are to mirror. Verse 4, what does our good God desire? He desires all men to be saved. Well, why doesn't he? Why doesn't he then? Why doesn't he save everyone? Why doesn't he? Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some consider slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You see, to be saved, you have to agree with God about your sin. Not everybody receives that gift of repentance. Not everybody confronts the holy God and his son's righteousness, they come with their own good works. They say, well, I am a, a good church attendee. I have paid my taxes. I was kind to animals. I'm a good person. No, to come to the holy God who desires that all men be saved, you have to agree with God. You have to agree with him about your sin about your need of a savior and his solution. Does he desire all men to be saved? Yes. He has that goodness about him. And yet, how will his justice be displayed? If he only demonstrates his mercy in saving all men, how will that aspect of God's character be displayed? If we really want to know just how good God really is, we need to look at the cross. What did his son go through out of God's love for us? He went through the justice that was reserved for us. In eternity, those that have not received the gift of repentance will enjoy what they have desired, and they will receive in fullest, fullest measure the punishment reserved for those that hate the Lord. So what does our good God desire? He desires all men to be saved and to know him. But 
he gives us a vote. He gives us a say to agree with him about what he provokes us to. Full knowledge involves acting on and experiencing the reality of the truth. Let me say that again. Full knowledge, if we have come to the full knowledge of the truth, it involves acting on and experiencing the reality of the truth in our own life. Has scripture impacted your life so that you look at it and you go, I'm going to do that. God's right. I should obey. That's the Holy Spirit working at you. Applying his sword just right where it needs to go. That's supernatural. It's glorious. If you have looked at scripture and agreed with it and responded to it, praise God with thanksgiving because that isn't happening to everybody, as we well know. Here's an application. If we come to the full knowledge of the truth, our conduct, our posture, our speech, and our thoughts will begin to conform to that of the image of Christ. It's a new makeover. There's a new creation. The old things are passing away. Christian, do you look more like Christ today than you did a year ago. Have you come to a full knowledge of the truth? I hope you have. It, it's so good when you know the goodness of God and his character, his compassion, his humility. He is lovely. Let's continue. How can we know that God is good? He came. He did not leave us in our broken state. When Adam and Eve, they ate the fruit, the Lord pursued them. He found them. The good shepherd finds. He came. He didn't write us off like we deserve. He didn't say, well, if they'll fix things, if they'll start acting right, then, then we can make a deal. No. He took the onus upon himself. He took the initiative. He came to us in broken humanity. He veiled himself in flesh to suffer for us. How do we know he's good? He came. That's proof. That's proof of God's goodness. Oh, one thing. You know, there's a really unique word that pops up only once in the New Testament. Ransom, verse 6, who gave himself as a ransom for all. That, that word, anti-lutron, it, it communicates a substitution and exchange. And, and I mention that because he stood in our place, taking the penalty that we deserve. He himself exchanged on our behalf. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 says of Christ, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he also has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them in him. Far from Christ being uh, beaten, that was the focal point of history, the cross, and Christ destroyed the sin guilt in himself. Okay, in verse 7, we'll ask this question. Is Christ our only model? I think we know on, on, on the face of it that no. And we see Christ's goodness, we know his humility, his compassion, his love, his mercy. We struggle to model ourselves after Christ is Christ, our only model. And Paul, writing to Timothy, is like, no. Verse 7, he says, For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. As a teacher to the 
of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul practices what he's preaching, the goodness of Christ, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. He came. Paul went. He was taken by the Lord. He was brought into the family of God. Paul practices what he preached. Now, what's interesting about this is there was a result. Now, we might tell ourselves we practice what we preach, and maybe we do, but is there a result? Do we have spiritual descendants? Paul did. Timothy is one. There's others. Philemon, we looked at him last week. Onesimus. Do we have spiritual descendants? Have we reproduced spiritually? Or are we just sitting around naming the name of Christ? I ask that because it's pretty important. Like produces like. Kind produces kind. The acorn does not fall far from the tree. Have you reproduced spiritually? Have you gone forth into the world? and made disciples? Have you taught them all that Christ commands? Food for thought. Have this way of thinking, which was also in Christ Jesus. Have you come to the full knowledge of the truth? There will be an output. There will be a product in your life. There was in Paul, and there was in Timothy. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, a little bit delayed on putting that one up. Paul also is a model of how to live out our faith. In verses 8 through 15, we have our third and final point, the life-changing results. If we have actually come to a full knowledge of the truth, there will be changes in every sphere of our life. There'll be changes within our family life, how we worship. If we have come to a full knowledge of the truth, things aren't going to look the way they do in cultural evangelical Christianity. Mm -mm. No, sir. Because cultural Christianity is just a shadow of what is already in the culture. It's like a, it's a bad fuzzy image. No, Knowing and having a full knowledge of the truth means that you're probably going to not look normal, which is probably a good thing. It's countercultural, it's different, and it's life changing. Paul writes in verse 8 Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Whoa. I want the men in every place to pray. Is there anything wrong with prayer? No, we're told to pray for all men. Is there a problem with wrath and dissension? Yeah, there is. Uh, you, don't, you wouldn't want to see that within the family of God, that disunity, that arrogance. You wouldn't want to see that. What about this lifting up holy hands? How will prayer and pleading change? Well, it's just an aspect of our life, but all attributes of our life change when we've come to a full knowledge of the truth. The whole of our lives is to be impacted with holiness. That even includes posture. Is this the only way to pray? Pastor Mark, do I have to wave my hands around? Do they need to go high? Do they need to go wide? Do they need to go in front? What, what am I supposed to do? Well, we just looked at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Was he doing that? No, he was kneeling. Abraham, Moses, they fell on their face in prayer. There's all kinds of postures for prayer. What matters is the holiness. The getting rid of that disunity, of that arrogant anger. The whole of our lives is to be impacted by the full knowledge of the truth. 
We're to have the same way of thinking that Christ has. Do you have to raise your hands? Well, Paul says, I want the men in every place to pray. It is a timeless statement. I would encourage your posture in whatever form it takes to reflect the internal reality that is made holy more and more. Does that mean you're on your knees? I spend time on my knees. Does it mean you're on your face? Okay, that too. Let your posture reflect the internal reality of the holiness that is a result of the full knowledge of the truth. Now, perhaps we disagree. It seems weird. You know what? I bet you Noah looked pretty weird for 100 years. And then he was vindicated, right? Some of the things that we look at in Scripture, we go, that's odd. What do I do with that? It might be an act of faith to do it. It may look odd compared to the culture. So be it. We didn't do, we didn't follow Christ to be popular with the world. I hope that's not the case. Now Christ tells us to pick up our cross and follow him. If we can't get over the hump of wrath and dissension, our prayers will be hindered. 1 Peter 3, 7 tells us that. And you married folks, you know. Men, you've read that passage. You know what it's talking about. If there's discord within the marriage, it feels like the wall of the ceiling is made of steel. Can't pray. You got to work through that discord. And so you can pray freely and have that relationship with your father. Always our outward appearances should reflect inward reality that looks like a change in posture when we pray, different forms. It also looks like a change in how people clothe themselves. How will outward image be affected? Verses 9 through 10 tell us. Likewise, in the same manner, this is the same issue, being impacted by holiness. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves, beautify themselves, with proper clothing, with modesty and self-restraint, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly clothing, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women professing godliness. Pastor Mark, you can't talk about women's clothes from the pulpit. I, it's here. You can't talk about women's fashion. I can. It's in God's word. What does God say is beautiful? What does he say is good and acceptable? It's not gaudy ornaments, it's looking like Christ. Have this way of thinking, which was also in Christ Jesus. Physical beauty is fleeting, but good works beautify and have a lasting reward. You ladies, you get beat up with this all the time. Uh, Proverbs chapter 31 Mother's Day is hard, right? I was going to go to Proverbs 31, and then you're going to feel bad because of all these things that you're not doing. Go to Proverbs 31, 30 with me. See the end result of having a full knowledge of the truth, of having a fear of the Lord. The result is so much more superior than physical beauty. Proverbs 31, verse 30. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. It's vanishing. It's going to go. But a woman who fears Yahweh, she shall be praised. Give to her from the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. You know what ornaments you and makes you look beautiful in the eyes of the one who matters? It's good works. It's godliness. Do you profess godliness? This is proper. This is 
right. Holy conduct validates the profession. Holy conduct validates the profession. We're going to get to this in just a little bit in verse 15. But uh, one of the great litmus tests that we have in our homes is our children. They tell us when we're hypocrites. They tell us when we fall short. I cherish that. I am so grateful for it because I need to be brought up short when I have fallen short. Ladies, because this is addressed to ladies, holy conduct validates our profession of faith. Do you profess to know Christ? Then don't try and impress people. Your only job is to impress the one who made you, the one who has called you into service. That's good. Don't put on the outward appearance, the ornaments that fade. Put on good works. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4 says that this is precious in the sight of God, a lowly and quiet spirit. Oh, you are not going to hear that anywhere in this world. 1 Peter 3, 4. A lowly and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. Well, I'll just read the verses before. Verse 3. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on garments, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible quality of a lowly and quiet spirit. This is a contented calm spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Can you braid your hair? Sure. Can you wear pearls? Yeah. Be modest. Don't try and be the center of attention. This isn't, this isn't earth shattering stuff. We're here for Christ, right? Okay. Okay. Now comes the exciting stuff. Verses 11 through 15. <laughs> A woman must learn in quietness and all submission. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first formed, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into trespass. But she will be saved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctification with self-restraint. Probably going to go over time. Okay, we got to unpack a lot of stuff here. There's a lot in here. People have questions. This is worth getting into. It's worth taking our time to do it. Paul writes, A woman must learn in quietness. He said, Kuya, silence. It means a contented quiet and all submission. Within the church, the learning should be calm. Not frantic, not subversive. How do I know? Paul writes, But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Pastor Mark, does that mean that women can't be pastors? Yes. And if you don't believe me, you can read the next chapter. It talks all about it. The role of the woman in the church is not to lead the church. <gasps> Who's that role given to? Men. Qualified men. Qualified men. What are the qualifications? Chapter 3 talks about it. Paul says, I do not allow epitrepo. That is a present active indicative first person singular. I want to talk about this because this is a hang up for a lot of people. Some will say, well, Paul didn't really mean I do not allow a woman for all time. So I don't presently allow a woman. Okay, let's, let's think about this, though, because you're going to hear that argument and many others. But I'm going to dismantle a few of them, and I'm going to tell you why it's good. This 
prohibition, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority, literally dominate over a man, is not limited to Ephesus. Grammatically, this is called the nomic present. It's a timeless statement. Prove it, okay? To suggest that at some point he might change his mind is not stated. You're just making an argument from the absence of data. Well, no, he just didn't say that. Is his word inspired? Is it inerrant or is it not? Secondly, should we do this to this text if we add, I don't presently allow a woman to dominate or teach a man? If we do that, should we do that with other prohibit prohibitions like that in Ephesians 5.18? Don't get drunk with wine. Well, I presently don't allow people to do that, but I'll change my mind in the 21st century. No. No. Thirdly, the argument is presented generally to women in general. It's, it is a general statement that is timeless. And then he roots the proof of that in creation. He says in verse 13, it was Adam who was first formed, and then Eve. This is before the fall. Adam was formed first to protect, to guide, to care for, to name the helpmate. It was Adam who was first formed, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into trespass. How is it that Satan wouldn't attack the first line of defense, but would come from the side? How is that possible? Would you do that? If you were going to take over, okay, I don't do personal illustrations, but in, in, Tank warfare, you learn not to shoot right at the turret and right at the front of the tank. You aim at the side. You aim at the base. You aim anywhere where the armor isn't the thickest. Satan didn't come where the armor was the thickest. He came at the woman, and she was deceived. She says that by her own admission. She says, the serpent deceived me. Genesis 3, 13, of course he did. And she was deceived, and yet Adam sinned with his eyes wide open. As was mentioned this morning, he wanted to be like God. He wasn't satisfied with what God had provided. So what do we do with this? Transmit this into action. Mark, teach me what this should look like. Okay, let's do that. Wives, you have a tremendous opportunity before you. You have an opportunity to foster and enhance your husband's spiritual growth or to hamstring it. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 14. Wives, you have a great opportunity. Yes, you are to keep silent, but the Lord in his providence has said that you can go to your husbands and they should be able to give you an answer for the things that you're curious about, that you want to be taught about. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, the women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. But if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. It's disgraceful for a woman to dominate a man and to instruct a man. It is disgraceful. It's an inversion of the created order. There's shame that's associated with that. Shame especially for the man who has set aside his spiritual obligations and is dominated, taught by a woman. Wives, you have a tremendous opportunity to foster and enhance your husband's spiritual growth. Some of you ladies are more spiritually mature than your husbands. Husbands, catch up. You are going to give an account, don't you know? You are no different than Adam. He has given you a helpmate to steward. 
catch up, protect, guide. She comes to you with an answer, good. She should not be coming to me first. If she has a question, she is to go to her husband first. This prohibition about keeping silent, does that mean that women can't sing? Does it mean that women can't pray out loud? Does it mean that women can't speak scripture? No, no. First Corinthians 11 talks about that. Women, you're supposed to have a contented quietness about you. You are to foster your own home's spiritual development. What's going to happen if you don't? If you come to me, your husband's going to be ignorant. If he can't give you an answer and you don't go to him, you go around him, he is going to remain ignorant. Husband, get with it. If your wife is more mature than you, get more mature. Do it. You, Ephesians chapter 5 talks about this. Boy, I'm going to try not to handle you guys too hard, but I have very strong feelings about this. We are to be like Christ in our relationship with our wife. We're to cleanse her and wash her with the water of the word so that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Husbands, love your wives more than your pride. You should be coming to me or the other elders if you have a question. That's okay. Good. Discipleship. Let's do it. That's right. That's proper. Then you can steward your family correctly. People do have questions. People are curious. That is okay. You, you take the reins in your home. The whole church will be impacted by this, and there will be contented and faithful fruitfulness as a result. But verse 15, when we save the best for last, it says of women, but she will be saved. So saith the tie, future passive, indicative, third person, singular. She will be saved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctification with self-restraint. Pastor Mark, is this saying that we can't be saved unless we have kids? No. Is this saying that unless our kids are saved, we can't be saved? Or if we have saved kids, then we will be saved? No, no, no. That is not what this is saying. We just looked at the salvation of Christ. We know. We know this. This is saying the state of her salvation will be proved out when her kids see the unhypocritical nature and the reality of their faith. It will be proven out. We can all look good for an hour. At the home level, that's when we start to see. And we know if somebody is a hypocrite. If this didn't penetrate us, if we didn't come to the full knowledge of the truth, if we didn't embrace it and show to our children how much it's worthy of our all, every aspect of our life, from our speech, our conduct, our posture, if we didn't prove that out in the home, why would they believe that? But for those that do, do you remember in the context portion? Man. Timothy had that, guys. Timothy had the benefit of that. Paul writes to him in 2 Timothy 1, verse 5, being reminded of the unhypocritical faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I'm convinced that it is in you as well. Does this guarantee you're going to have safe kids? No. But does not mean that God can't put somebody like an apostle we don't have apostles now, but you know what I'm talking about. Somebody in the way of your wayward prodigal child to speak the truth to them at some future point. If they have been taught, if they have been nurtured, if you have trained them up in the way they should go, you have done what you could. And now you know the limits of your effectiveness. You turn it over to the Lord. 
it's in good hands. Possibly, if that child had been given to anybody else, they would have been too far gone. But God gave that child to you to pray for, to steward, to demonstrate the reality of your faith. There is evidence that people believe, ladies believe, not when they invert church order and dominate men, but when they steward the children that have been lovingly entrusted by their great God and Father to them. When they have nurtured them and trained them in the way they should go. Oh, I, I hope that you take seriously that nurture and admonition. Don't let a day go by that they don't see the reality of your faith. I have more to say. You can join us tomorrow or tonight at the evening service and you can bring your burning questions. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. This is a tough load, right? This is a, a hard chapter. Try not to shy away from them. I try and wrap my arms around them. You hug the cactus and you explain it. <laughs> and that's good. We don't want a preacher that beats around the bush and, and then apologizes for what God says. Mm, no. Life is short. We want the truth. And having come to the knowledge of the truth, we want to respond in the right way. A second, or Philippians chapter 2 talks about the right way. And it's, it's what our Savior did. We're, we'll join the text in verse 1. I'm just going to read through to verse 11. It'll stand out. We know that we're to have this way of thinking, which was also in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and compassion, fulfill my joy, that you think the same way by maintaining the same love, being united in spirit, thinking on one purpose, doing nothing from selfish ambition or vain glory, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourselves, not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this way of thinking in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a slave, by being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If we've come to a full knowledge of the truth, if we've grasped what Christ has done for us, we too will have this way of thinking in ourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. I urge you to take seriously God's word this week. Let's stand and I'll close in prayer. Father God, we do thank you for your spirit. We are thankful for the word which he authored. We're thankful for how it proves to us what it is to live rightly in accordance with the truth. Lord, I pray that you would give us stamina and endurance to do this because there will not be anyone in the world that, that encourages us in this. Oh Lord, I pray that you would strengthen homes Strengthen men to lead their wives. Strengthen wives as they teach and nurture their children. Strengthen us as we pray to you for the salvation of all men. 
I pray, Lord, that uh, we would set ourselves as an example to those that will follow behind what it is to think like Christ. It's in his name we pray.